you are the manifestation of a multi-centuries line of composers in Western music. The Scottish Chamber Orchestra is 40 years old this year. I uh, have been associated with it since at least 1987 or so. They said, well, we know the piece. All you have to do is beat. <laughs> And yeah. so we made the recording, and that was my first experience of conducting, although I must have conducted it very badly. I have no idea. I was terrified. During that time with the SCO, are there any sort of um, gossipy or dodgy things that you can remember that you perhaps wouldn't want to talk about? But that's very naughty, and I didn't say it. <laughs> Anyway, we better, let's talk about this piece, The Ebb of Winter. It's the music of a mature composer. It will present difficulties, but I tried to make it a celebratory piece, and that helps. Well, good, e good evening, everyone, and welcome to this pre-concert talk. Um, I'd like to introduce you to... Doesn't need any introduction at all. We all know Max over the, over the many years. So welcome, Max. I'm Steve King, uh, one of the viola players in the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. And the thing about this talk, unlike some of the talks that Max does um, with journalists or, or critics and audience listening to his music, I come from a very practical point of view. I come from within the orchestra. In fact, the violas are right in the middle of the orchestra. Uh, so I play the music. And also, uh, years ago, Max used to do a lot of conducting of, of his works with us and, and other composers' works. And so for, uh, for quite a long time, I was a, at the receiving end of Max's beat. <laughs> or not beat. Anyway. So, and I had to be at the receiving end of his playing. <laughs> <laughs> Ever the humorist. Right, OK. <laughs> so, um, Max, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about Max himself, but then a little bit about this new piece as well. Um, you are the manifestation of a multi-centuries line of composers in Western music from a thousand years ago, plain chant through Perutan, through Palestrina, Monteverdi, Bach, Beethoven, Wagner, Schoenberg, and here you are, part of that line, and your influence on other people is a, is a wide spectrum of, of um, musicians all over the world, uh, including my path has been heavily influenced by what, what you've given me through yourself and through also the Mag St. Magnus Festival and your music. So where do you see your major influences in that line, both musically and non-musically, global, sort of philosophers or Orkney, in f five sentences? <laughs> <laughs> I think when I look back, there are two things that I particularly feel I've made a small difference to, and one is music education for young people. When I was very young, I taught for three years at Sirencester Grammar School, a grammar school for boys and girls in Gloucestershire. And although I was to totally unaware of it, evidently it was groundbreaking stuff because I got the children to compose from day one. They improvised in groups, they composed in groups and they began to compose individually and I learned so much from that and the wonderful thing is that um, I'm still in touch with quite a lot of those children some of them are grandparents now and uh, just the other day I got a letter out of the blue from a fellow who said you won't remember me but I remember him very well um, but uh, it would be lovely to be in touch and I still play the trombone, and I still play in the choir, sing in the choir, and it made such a difference to my life. And I thought, that was a lovely thing to get as a nice surprise through the post the other day. And the other thing is, I think, 
quite a lot of composers with whom I've dealt, I think they've benefited from what I have tried to open their ears and eyes to, and I have certainly benefited from teaching, and I still do, I still teach once a term for a week, deal with the composers at the Royal Academy in London. And I think this is reciprocal, and uh, there are these composers, they, they come from all over the world. And I remember the first time I taught at a university, which was in 1966, when I was composer in residence at Adelaide in Australia. And I realized how important this contact with young composers was. And I'm very pleased that I think most of the composers in Australia, they were in my class. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, going off on a little um, on a different track now. The Scottish Chamber Orchestra is 40 years old this year. Uh, how long have you been associated with the orchestra? I uh, have been associated with it since at least 1987 or so. Right. And I had a commission uh, which. I didn't conduct at first because I didn't conduct. But um, then I wrote this piece, I th think it was 88, I can't remember exactly, uh, called Into the Labyrinth for tenor, Neil Mackey, an orchestra. And the conductor performed it here and in Edinburgh and in Perth. And then there was an opportunity to record it for a commercial record. And the Scottish Arts Council had some money left over at the end of the year, can you believe it? And they offered to pay for a recording. Well, the conductor who'd done the performances wasn't available. So they said, well, well would you do it? And I said, well, I don't conduct orchestras. I don't do anything about it. So I don't know who in the orchestra, it might have been John Steer, said, well, we know the piece, all you have to do is beat. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. so we made the recording, and that was my first experience of conducting, although I must have conducted it very badly. I have no idea, I was terrified. But it was, it was a wonderful project for us. That was the start of a very strong, rich relationship. It with was, you. yes. Um, so what, what do you see as a major landmark or major landmark in your relationship with the SCO? Uh, now, that's a difficult one because there were so many. Hmm. I think I was asked to do a few concerts with them. And again, it was funny because they said, well, you'll have to do something apart from your own music in the concert. And I said, well, all right, I'll do my best. And they said, well, Haydn, Mozart, we all know it, so you don't really have to conduct. So that's what I did. And it was, I think, a very important day was when the Arts Council and what was then Strathclyde Council got together and they commissioned not one, which any composer would be perfectly happy with, but 10 concertos for different members of the orchestra. And that was a wonderful day. I thought, how am I going to do this? My goodness, but I'll take it on. <laughs> and I conducted the first performances of all of those concertos here in this hall, which was very different in those days, mm. and then the next day in Edinburgh. Mm. And in each of those concerts, I conducted other work, uh, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, whatever. And also, with each concerto, there was an education project linked to it, whereby a young composer, Jimmy Millen or Judith Weir or whoever it was, came along and they went into schools who were chosen beforehand and worked with the children on material from the concerto, getting them to compose works which were related to my piece. And this was wonderful and there were concerts with members of the orchestra and their school groups, school orchestras or whatever, where these pieces were done. 
And then the children, a lot of them, would come along to the concert here. And I remember one lovely occasion when this group of girls from a school came backstage to me uh, after, they think it was the cello concerto. And they said, we loved your concerto, but what was that awful piece by that Schubert person? <laughs> Pioneering stuff. Yes. <laughs> was it, I've, I've, excuse me, just for a moment. There's a lovely story. We were doing the double bass concerto. I can't remember which number that was. Um, but nor it, can I. It was with. I think it's eight. Number no, eight. Seven. seven. I don't know. Nine. With with Duncan McTeer doing the this, this double bass solo, and we took it on a tour of England, and we did one concert in Lancaster. And Duncan and I, in those days, were very good friends, and we drove around together. And we decided that um, we would stay in really nice places in the countryside um, when we did our concerts down in England. So we got this wonderful old inn in a place actually called the New Inn near uh, Appleby. And we, it took about an hour to get from Lancaster to there after the concert. And we arranged for them to give us food and keep the bar open. Um, <laughs> As you do with musicians, come on. And um, so we, we arrived and we had a couple of pints and we started eating. And there were these two old guys sat in the corner. I think I told you this about no. 10 years ago. No. I mean, two old guys sat in the corner and it was all the and thou's to each other, you know, real sort of um, Cumbria. And uh, they, they overheard Duncan and I talking about music, etc. And they started talking to us. He's lad, what have you, you been doing? So he said, you know, we've been doing a concert with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra in Lancaster. And uh, this is Duncan, he plays double bass. In fact, he's the concerto, he plays the solo. Oh, what was the piece? We said, uh, a, a, new, a new work by Sir Peter Maxwell Davis, uh, a double bass concerto. And one of them said, E, not our Max. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, our Max from Salford. I said, yeah, that's the one. He says, I remember Max when he was that high. He said, <laughs> he, said he used to work with your father. Ah. He was uh, a, a, um, um, an engineer of yes, a, 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 yes. a, a tool maker, uh, not a tool maker. A... Well, they made theodolites. Yes, they? yeah. And uh, this, this guy used to work with Max's father, knew Max as he was growing up. Yes. So, <laughs> it's a small world. Yep. Anyway, during that time with the SCO, there's four walls here, right? During that time with the SCO, are there any sort of um, gossipy or dodgy things that you can remember <laughs> that you perhaps wouldn't want to talk about? <laughs> He said, ask me anything. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, well, um, I think the, uh, it's, it was difficult sometimes mm -hmm. because I hadn't got any experience as an orchestral conductor. And the orchestra, I think, between you and me, they were the best teachers I could possibly have, but sometimes quite severe, and that I don't mind at all, I can take it. And I actually really had to think about conducting in a way that I'd never done before. And I was, well, I, <laughs> I don't think I was ever a very good conductor, but it sort of worked. But the, the lovely thing is that you, the composer was there with this new music, and it was a big project for us. It was, It wasn't yes. just another new piece of music. We no. had a lot of music from you, and we got to know and understand you and your music really well. And the lovely thing was that before I wrote a concerto for a specific member of the SCO, flute, oboe, whatever it was, horn, um, trumpet, we did a concerto together for that instrument so that I could really get to know that player's sound. Mm. And I think writing them extended me sometimes an awful lot of musical thought went into something. I almost became a clarinet or a flute and you were concentrating so hard on it. And we would, um, we would actually be in the band room or the green room warming up and perhaps an oboe player or a clarinetist or something would be doing something fancy and there would be Max yes, peeping around listening. the <laughs> Listening. <laughs> um, and you would listen and of course a player is always off guard trying extremes of the register and all mm. sorts of things which aren't in the orchestration book mm. before they go on stage and I listened and put some in. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyway, we better, let's talk about this piece, The Ebb of Winter. We've been rehearsing this piece the last two days with Ollie Nussen. <coughs> First of all, Ollie is the perfect person um, for conducting this type of music. He understands contemporary music, he treats it with the same respect as any other music, um, he looks for the quality, and um, uh, it's, it's a joy actually working with someone who goes into such great detail, who treats a piece with such respect. And I, I really believe that tonight we're going to give a, a wonderful performance of this piece, yeah. um, because we all feel good about what we've done these last two days. But tell us about this piece. Is it just an abstract piece of music, or is there an underlying story or character that we should look for? There is an underlying story. I was asked, could I write a piece to celebrate 40 years of the orchestra? So I wrote a piece which I hope presented enough virtuoso parts and enough fast music, enough towards well, the opening and towards the end of the piece, positive and uplifting, to use a very old-fashioned word, music, which was suitable for the occasion. It's called Ebb of Winter. I was at home in Orkney in February of this year, and I wrote this piece because it appeared as if winter was going and uh, the snowdrops came out and then came the bad weather, bang, and uh, it was all wrong. It was a false spring, if you like. But I was so pleased. And of course, sometimes people really complain about my orchestration that things aren't quite clear. Well, of course they're not, because you walk along the beach outside the house and there's spray coming up from the sea and there's a ha and there are wonderful mists come in and so what you see very often is not crystal clear. It's moving through the spray of a wave and multicolored so it changes all the time. And I think in this piece that is something which, for the first time hearing it in reality today, as opposed to in my head, it was very clear, particularly in the early parts of the piece, that walking along that beach, which I do every day, it changes and changes and changes. And it's got into that music, and I think that's a very important thing to bear in mind. And. <laughs> The image that was left at the end of the piece when I heard it today was pale sun, winter sun, behind spray. And I think it will go down in my memory as that, on that level. But there are also other things in the piece which I was quite surprised about. That it's got some very dark music in there, which I'm sure everybody in the orchestra noticed and Ollie had commented on, mm. but I wasn't really quite aware of. And it's as if the music knew something that I didn't. And for various reasons, I had had, personally, a very difficult two and a half, three years. and. I was already, while I was writing this, being quite ill and for no reason at all just passing out. And eventually I was persuaded to go to see the doctor and I was immediately taken into hospital. I happened to be in London and told, well, if you don't go in now, you've got six weeks to live. You've got a very chronic form of leukemia. So in I went and went through this chemotherapy and just as when I wrote my sixth symphony for the Royal Phil, and while I was writing the last movement, my dear friend, the Orcadian poet George Mackay Brown died, and he died at the exact moment that I finished it. And at the end, that music knows that something absolutely dreadful and tragic in my life is going to happen because I lost a source of inspiration and a very great friend in that wonderful poet. And in this one, listening this afternoon, 
I thought, yes, your music knew what was going to happen. And of course, it's all all right now because I'm completely clear and uh, perfectly healthy as far as you can be after all that. You have to have your blood tested, but um, it's wonderful because, of course, the end of the piece is optimistic and it does finish triumphantly. Oh. And I like to think on a personal level that, yes, we got through that. Of course, I have to have my blood tested and all that every month. But um, I keep pinching myself thinking, hey, you're alive, you're alive. And uh, this... oh, we're, we're happy too. <laughs> <laughs> so that is really, I think, the story of the piece. First of all, when I was writing it, just full of the wonder of my daily walks along the beach and watching the change of the light and the coming of the spring. And then this extraordinary personal thing, which I think the music knew, but I didn't on two levels. On the one, the potentially catastrophic thing of going through all that, but then the absolute joy of coming through it and here I am and I've written another symphony and uh, I'm going to go on and this is quite wonderful so it works on three levels. No, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really super piece. More, more. <laughs> <laughs> In fact it's a really super programme. We've got yeah. one, of, one of my favourite uh, composers and, and concerti, the Bartok's third piano concerto, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous yeah. piece and Stravinsky's Symphony in C, which is, an, once again, an amazing piece. OK, I've got a question. <laughs> We've got the audience, or some of the audience here. They're going to hear this new piece for the first time. What do you expect of them? It's a, Steve, that's a good question. I know. Um, <laughs> and... It's one that I can only answer with some difficulty because in the 50s and 60s, audiences went to a new work and a lot of the composer's idea was to épater les bourgeois or whatever and you were going to hear something which was shocking and dissonant and that was, if you like, almost a convention. And these days, exactly the opposite. You go to a new piece, and it's usually tonal, and is much more easy to listen to. Uh, a lot of it, I think, is easy listening. But that's very naughty, and I didn't say it. <laughs> but I think with this piece, and other things I've written recently, they are not like the things I wrote in the 60s, late 50s, nothing like that. And I think this should register that it's the music of a mature composer. It's not avant-garde. It's not, I think, the music of a tired old man. It's very vital, I hope. But it does make demands. It makes harmonic demands, it makes rhythmic demands on the players particularly, but some of it is quite complex. And some of it, for instance, towards the end, there's, a, from a compositional point of view, virtuoso thing I did, which was make a mensuration canon. That's a canon where your voices come in in different stages to different rhythmic patterns, and I won't explain, but it is very difficult. It's like playing double thirds in prestissimo all over the piano. And It works, though. It, it, it works really well. It's, mm. The thing was to make the harmony work, mm. and that is very, very difficult, and I'm very pleased that I did it. And, of course, it's quite a calm bit of music, and I think that, for me, represents something that I would like to think of as maturity, but no less technically, emotionally, spiritually aware than anything that I did when I wrote eight songs for Mad King or whatever, those early pieces. Mm. And it's a mature piece, and it will present difficulties, but I tried to make it a celebratory piece, and that helps. And it 
will, I hope, be listened to with pleasure, is that a word I dare use? For its rhythm and for its harmony and for its drama. It's quite dramatic. And that would give me great, great satisfaction if that were so. In fact, if you could hear it, like the mature work of any composer in history, that would be lovely. There's a lot, there's a lot of beauty in it. There's a lot of um, lovely solos. Being a viola player, obviously, you know, we're looking at, at our part perhaps more than others yeah. sometimes. We have an amazing principal viola, Jane Atkins, and Max has written a few s smallish solos within this piece, and they, they really sound absolutely gorgeous. It's not just um, her playing, it, it's the way you've written them. Same for the oboe, etc. Well, you see, that's but, because I did all that work with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. <laughs> But he's been a swine as well. Yeah. <laughs> if you, if right in the middle of the piece, there's, there's some stuff where, where the two trumpet players are doing these ascending, I don't know what to call them, but they are really, really difficult. And I'm sure these guys, um, first of all, haven't had as much sleep as they'd like this week and certainly haven't been drinking beer this week either. Um, so there, there's, there's moments of real beauty, of real grandeur as well. Yeah. Um, but the opening, the opening is stunning. The horn, the horns uh, just, just really set the thing off. And, and, and then there's, there's beauty, but there's, there's, there's this real crescendi and, and, and some of this, like I said, the stuff that you give to the trumpets, um, yeah. which is, is, is sort of shadowed in, in other parts of the piece as well. So there's, there's plenty to look out for. And also, other little things to grasp onto is the, the Scottish snap. Yeah. Bada, bada, bada. This, this sort of thing happens a lot in Max's music, and it's still there. It, it dominates various sections of the music. So um, that, I guess that's the influence of the Orkney folk yeah, music. Yeah, the Orkney folk music, yeah, yeah. which is just there. I've mm -hmm. written so much stuff very quietly for the Orkney, for the Sanday Fiddle Club, the mm -hmm. little music club fiddle group that is on the island where I live, and for the schools and so on. Mm. And you make no fuss about that, but it gets to you. Mm -hmm. I think we probably have to stop now. It's, it's coming on seven o'clock. Max, thank you so much. Well, it's thank a, you. It's a thank joy to, to hear you.